in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the lights go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. talking about difficulties in prayer. Well, the habitual difficulty in prayer, one of them, is distraction. Uh, we're all distracted in prayer. Everyone has distractions in prayer, and it's kind of even distressing sometimes. Uh, we have to try to overcome them, but if you are very distracted in prayer, um, I will give you the advice that St. Teresa of Avila gave. Um, don't worry about it. Okay? Uh, I, I, that doesn't mean don't do anything about it. It means don't worry about it. It means everybody. Everybody has distractions in prayer, sometimes. Now, we try to overcome them. As soon as we're aware that we're distracted, we bring our mind back onto our prayers. But do not allow yourself to be discouraged because of distraction in prayer, okay? Overcome it, and you might say, but I can't overcome it, Father. I've tried everything, and I'm still distracted in prayer. And guess what I'm going to give you for advice? <laughs> exactly. Pray for the grace to overcome distraction in prayer. You see? that Whatever you're having trouble with, you know, let's not just talk about it or agonize over it, let's do something about it. And what can we do? We can pray. You have problems with distractions, pray to overcome that, and God will give the grace. But you have to be persevering in your prayer. Don't just say a Hail Mary, and then you say, but Father, I'm no better. Well, keep praying. <laughs> keep praying. And, and, and the Lord will give the grace. I promise you that. To set about hunting down distractions, the Catechism says, would be to fall into that trap when all that is necessary is to turn back to our heart. Okay, when you're distracted, don't, don't be preoccupied with hunting down every little thing that distracts you. Then you fall right into the trap. Okay? What you do is just go back to the center. Go back to your heart. Recollect yourself. And just begin again. Don't be disturbed by it. Don't be distressed. Don't say, oh, I could never be a person of prayer. Just go right back. Unite yourself in your heart with the Lord. Now, it helps uh, to have a quiet place. That's why we talked about silence. It helps us a lot to avoid distraction. But even if you're, believe me, sometimes I'm in my hermitage in the mountains and there's no noise. I, I, <laughs> last week at the retreat uh, for the novices, that I, one hour a day, I had a question and answer session. And the novice mistress told me, well, let them write out their questions on a piece of paper, because a lot of them won't speak up, because, you know, some people don't like to speak in public. So we did that. They made a little box, and, um, and they put their questions in this little question box. And one hour every day, I would take the questions, and I would, I would and try to answer the questions as best that I could. And some of them were, were great. Some of them were highly theological. Uh, the, the sisters are, are really intelligent, and, and they know the faith, and they ask some tremendous uh, questions. Uh, but some of them were, were quite, quite simple, and um, I was continually telling them that, you know, well, oh, you have this problem then pray for it. And I did that for eight days. And, and, and by the end of the retreat, you know, I would come to a thing and I would just pause and in unison, 60 voices would say, pray for it. And, and so they, um, I guess they got the message. 
after a while. But everybody has that problem of being distracted. Just return to the Lord in your heart. Now, these distractions, the Catechism tells us, this is the battle of prayer, one part of it. So we're distracted. We're thinking about a thousand and one things. You recollect yourself, you begin to pray, and you remembered that you forgot to do something at the office, <clears throat> or you forgot to give one of the kids their lunch, or this, or that, or the other thing. And that's the battle. And the Catechism says, therein lies the battle, the choice of which master to serve. And so at the time that you're praying, pray. Pray. Make that a sacred time. You know, if you say, okay, this 15 minutes is for the Lord. This hour is for the Lord. Don't allow anything else to intrude into that space. Just don't permit it. You say, but I, I can't help it, Father. I do permit it. It keeps happening. Well, then what can we do about it? Pray for the grace that it doesn't happen. Pray for anything that you can't overcome. Pray. If you have, I always tell people, if you have favorite sins, you know, that's what I call those ones that we confess all the time, <laughs> favorite sins. You know, you go to confession month after month or week after week, and, and it seems that you, where, you know, where have I heard that before or where have I said that before? Well, last confession probably and the one before that. So those sins, they go on and on and on. Well, we all have that problem sometimes, but what do you do to overcome that? Well, you pray. I tell people every morning, if your problem, um, whatever your problem is, you know, uh, oh, I criticize people too much. Okay. Every morning, when you make your morning offering, you begin your day, uh, you know how, the, uh, how uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has this saying, one day at a time? Well, we, we're all kind of compulsive that way. And so one day at a time. So I pray, oh, dear Lord, just for this day, just for this day, let me be humble. Or just for this day, let me not judge my neighbor. Or whatever it might be. Pray for the grace. And I mean specifically, recall it to mind, whatever it may be. Give it to Our Lady. Ask her to help you. Offer three Hail Marys to overcome it just that day. And if you do that each day for a while, I assure you, you will uproot any vice and replace it with a virtue, prayer. It's the way to overcome anything. It's the way to accomplish anything. I know it sounds simple, and it sounds too simple, and that's why a lot of people just won't do it. But if you do do it, you will find out that the simple things of God are filled with power. The battle against our self, distraction, or anything else involves vigilance, for we know the master is coming. And so we should be vigilant, watchful. Now another difficulty, especially those for those who want to sincerely pray, who want to increase in their ability to pray, is dryness. Now I spoke about that this morning. Dryness goes with the territory. You know, uh, you, can, you can be so devoid after a while of feelings. People tell me all the time, but Father, you know, in the beginning of my conversion or my reconversion, I was so uh, devoted. I, I loved to pray. And I, but now, you know, I don't have those feelings anymore. Uh, well, love isn't merely a feeling. And prayer is a question of love. Love is a decision. Love is an act of the will. And so if you say, but I don't feel like praying. Well, that's like saying on certain days, I don't feel like loving my wife. On certain days, I don't feel like loving my husband. I just don't have those feelings today. Well, you're called to transcend feelings. Love is not merely feelings. Love can involve feelings, certainly. But love is more than feelings. It's a decision. It's an act of the will. And so you decide to love, all right? You make an act of the will. I'm going to do it. You know, like the Nike commercial, just do it. Well, that's the way it is. Just do it. But I, I, I find it difficult to love the poor. Just do it. Why? Because Jesus lives in the poor, just like he lives in anybody else and more so. 
And so you might say, but I, I, you know, I, if I look at a street person, they're dirty, they might smell bad, maybe they're drunk, um, all kinds of things. What do you have to do? You just do it. But how can I do it? I just don't have those feelings, transcend feelings. You have to realize that everyone we serve is the presence of God. There isn't a human being ever that wasn't created in the image of God. I don't care how poor they are. I don't care how sinful they are. There's not a single human being that wasn't created in God's own image. And so you need to pray for the grace to be able to see Jesus in everybody. Now, you may say, but I'm not good at that, Father. I've never been able to really love people that are not lovable. Well, number one, of course, you have to pray for it. But number two, God will help you in the difficulty. Let's say you can't stand the poor. You don't like street people, uh, especially if they're bothersome. Well, sure enough, God will give you a grace. What he will do is he will send someone to you. <laughs> All of a sudden, out of nowhere, some street person will take a great liking to you. And you will be intimidated or frightened, and you'll want to say, get away from me. But instead, you should smile at them. Do you know that you can save a soul with a smile? I mean that, literally. I'm not just saying that to be, you know, nice and have some nice, pious-sounding expression coming out of my mouth. I mean, literally, you can save a soul. You can save somebody's eternal life with a smile, with a look of compassion, in my own life, I remember that happened to me more than once, when I was down and out, when I was lost and looking for someone to find me. I didn't know that, but I was a street person, literally. Sometimes I say that. I said it last week in a layperson at the retreat, sitting in back of the chapel, uh, said to me, oh, no, it was in the church at the profession ceremony, and someone said, well, Father, that wasn't a true true story that you told, was it? That, that you were really like that? I mean, you're a priest. You couldn't have been like that. And I said, oh, I assure you that every word of it was true. Very true. But you couldn't have been a street person. Yes, I was. But you, you didn't really not have a place to live. Oh, yes, I didn't have a place where you didn't really sleep on a park bench. Oh, yes, I did. You mean to tell me you had nothing to eat? No. You mean to tell me people actually spit on you? Yes. I mean it exactly that way. And I remember when I was at a low point, having lost everything. All my friends abandoned me, everything gone, destitute. I was sitting on the same park bench I used to sit at on when I was a wealthy man. When I was a very wealthy man, I used to sit on that park bench and kind of glory in my success. I, I would take a break. It was around the corner from where my office used to be in Encino. And I went back there, and I sat on that same bench, totally lost, totally destitute, and knowing that I, who was a poor boy when I grew up, had become a very wealthy man and had lost it all through my own negligence, stupidity, immorality, and that was just killing me. And I was a loser, and I felt like a loser. And I sat on that bench, and I was really um, sick in my heart. I was brokenhearted. I was frightened. And a, a, an older woman came along, and she stopped. And she looked at me. And she smiled the most compassionate smile, and she just touched me on my shoulder, and she said, it's going to be all right. And then she went on. She might have saved my life, honestly, honestly. You can save someone's life by kindness, and if you don't feel you have that kind of kindness, then begin to pray for it in earnest. And so we have a battle. Prayer overcomes all things. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it cannot bear any fruit, and so we're called continually to die to self in order to rise in Christ. And that's the battle of prayer, too. Distractions. We have many things to do, many, many things to do.
But we don't have anything more important to do than to unite ourselves with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and enter into prayer. We face temptations, many temptations in prayer. The Catechism says that this expresses itself by a declared lack of, by itself by declared lack of belief. Oh, okay, I'm reading this wrong. This is what happens when you have notes, especially 350 pages of them. Sometimes you, you have a typo and you wonder, what, what does that mean? I left a word out. Sometimes this, one of these temptations in prayer, a temptation against faith, isn't so much because we say, I don't believe. Not that many of us say that. They say, oh, I can't pray because I don't believe. Uh, we don't have that problem. But actually, one of the subtle uh, temptations that we have in faith is by our preferences, okay? We, we say one thing, but we do another. Now, if I believe with all my heart, mind, and strength that Jesus is here in the Eucharist, I'll give you an example of what the Catechism is talking about. If I believe that, really, truly, to the depths of my being, then how is it that I can leave him alone day after day after day and never come to visit him? How is it that Jesus is here waiting for me, Emmanuel, God among us, and I never make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament or rarely? How can that be? Well, you see, it's not that we've declared. We believe. We say, of course I believe. And I know you do. And I do too. But sometimes by our actions, we betray ourselves. All right? You believe that God is all-powerful. I'm sure you believe that God is omnipotent. Having all power, then why is it that we don't trust him? Oh, I trust God. Oh, do you? Well, how come you're worried about this, that, or the other thing? How come I worry about this, that, or the other thing? If I believe God is God, all-powerful, all-seeing, all-loving, then how come I don't trust him? I say one thing, and I live another. And so to narrow the gap between what we believe and what we live, knowing that God is God, I put all my confidence in him like a little child. I know you are God. I know you have all power. I know your name is mercy and love. Therefore, I trust you. And I refuse to worry about that cancer that I might have. I refuse to believe my children will be lost because they're not going to church anymore. I know that if I pray and I'm faithful, you will answer my prayers because you're all loving, you're all good, you're all powerful. God wants to make you a saint. Do you believe it? Ah, in your heart you say, well, I know God wants us to be saints, but probably he wants everybody else to be a saint, but not me. Because <laughs> I don't feel like a saint. And so God probably isn't giving me the grace to be a saint because I don't feel it. Love isn't a feeling. Love is a decision. I assure you, God wants you to enter into the perfection of charity. That means be a saint. Believe it. Accept the grace. God can do it. I can't do it. You can't do it. God can do it. For man, it's impossible. For God, all things are possible. God wants to make you a saint. He wants to perfect you in charity. Believe it. Now, if he's all-powerful, he can do it, can he? Of course he can. Now, if he's all-loving and all-merciful, he will do it. So he can, and he will. And so trust him. And so narrow that gap between what we profess and what we live. Very important. That's a temptation. That's a temptation against faith when we implicitly act in a way that would negate or deny God's infinite love for us. Sometimes we turn to the Lord as a, last, as a last resort. Ah, that's a difficulty in prayer. You know, you might kind of take God for granted. I might take God for granted until some crisis comes along. And then, boy, we pray like monks. Oh, Lord, deliver me from this terrible evil. I, I want to tell you, my grandmother told me 
that more vows were made to God during World War I and World War II than in all the convents put together. She said, my grandfather said, all the soldiers in World War I, boy, they were in the trenches, you know, and mustard gas and all. Oh, Lord, if you'll deliver me from this day, I promise I'll go and I will live a holy life and become a saint, and I'll say novenas every day in your honor from now till doomsday. Oh, boy, I'll tell you what. When we have a crisis, boy, we can pray. Now, the other, the rest of them, oh, Father, I just don't know how to pray. You know, I'm not good at it. I don't have, and then a crisis comes along, and wow. <laughs> okay, so let's not do that. Now, sometimes we enlist the Lord as an ally. You know, we're, we're distressed. We're in trouble. So we enlist him as an ally, but we remain kind of presumptuous. You know, our heart has to be humble in prayer. Well, Lord, look, I've got this and this and this and this, and you've got to help me. And, and actually, at least implicitly, a lot of people have the attitude, look, if you don't help me, don't expect me to be your friend. And so you better come across or else. Some people have that attitude. I don't know that I haven't had that attitude at one time or another in my life. We get desperate. And we say, you know, I can't take it anymore. Lord, how much can I put up with? And if you don't help me, you know, maybe I'm not going to stick around. You know, maybe I'll go serve the world or chase money instead of you. And, you know, that's a presumptuous. Now, God understands our weakness, and he doesn't get mad at us. But I think, you know, if you're in love with someone and they treated you that way, you, you might, you won't stop loving them, but you could be offended by that. It could hurt you. And so we shouldn't do that. Now, there's another temptation to which presumption opens the gate, and that's called uh, acedia or acedia. The spiritual writers understand by this a form of depression due to a lax ascetical practice, decreasing vigilance, carelessness of heart. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right? We, we sometimes don't want to face the, the struggle that it takes to advance in prayer. You know, it can be hard. We don't want to persevere. We get depressed. Oh, I can't be a person of prayer. I'm so distracted. Or God doesn't listen to me, and I, why bother? And so we, we don't want to endure the effort that it takes to be perfected in prayer. And so we get depressed, and we even cop out, and we quit. The humble, the humble are not surprised by the distresses of life. You know, a humble person knows that they're weak. I know, by the grace of God, I know that I'm a weak person. I know that I'm not very clever. I know that I'm not very strong. I know that I have all kinds of deficiencies. I know that from experience. Uh, that's not some kind of phony humility. That's just a statement of truth. I know that. That's reality. Now, that reality, in the light of that truth, I'm not surprised anymore when I fall on my face. Why would I be surprised that I mess up? I've done it so many times that I, don't, I, I can't find it distressing anymore. No, I try not to do it. I try not to do it. I try to do the best I can. We have to try and do the best we can. But if you have some humility and you fall on your face, even if you sin, even if you're a really good person and all of a sudden you fall flat on your face in mortal sin and you, you scandalize yourself and you think, how could I have done that? Well, don't be surprised and don't be distressed and don't be discouraged. Know that God loves you right where you are. He knows your weakness. 10 trillion years ago, from all eternity, he knew all about it. He knew that that would happen to you that day, that moment. And yet he loved you so much that he sent his only son to suffer and die on a cross. And most of all, to rise again so that you can rise again. And so if you fall, get up. And don't use that as an excuse to be discouraged or depressed or to quit. Fall, get up and go on. God is with you. Filial trust. We have to trust God. Now, I, I gave a whole conference on trust to the sisters last week. 
Filial trust is an absolute prerequisite to advancement in prayer. You've got to trust God. It's really an insult not to trust God. You know, can you imagine if, if some great king were your best friend, and the king had all the power in the kingdom, and he really loved you, and you were close to this king, wouldn't that king be a little bit put out if you inferred that he can't help you or that he's not powerful enough to get you out of the mess that you've gotten yourself into? You've got to trust God absolutely. Don't hold back on trust. Trust with all your heart, with all your strength. Our Lord said as much to blessed Faustina, you know, the divine mercy devotion. Our Lord told blessed Faustina that trust is, is like a receptacle. When we go to a well, you know, if you go to a well, you need a bucket or something to get the water out. And trust is like that receptacle. The bigger your trust, the more you permit God to work in your life. If you trust God this much, you're allowing him to give you that much mercy and grace. If you have unbounded trust, God can do anything. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. And so I refer again to Mother Teresa, a little sister, a little religious, poor, humble. What did she do? She left the comfort of her convent in Lo at the, the Sisters of Loreto. She left that she was headmistress of a, of a school, she, well respected, very comfortable, a solemnly professed religious, and God shows her that she's to go out into the slums of Calcutta and work with the poorest of the poor. And so she did it with nothing to start with, just trust in God. And she went out and she began. The longest journey still requires that the first step be taken. And you may say, but I'm so far from sanctity. And I tell you, take the first step. And know that it's not you who have to walk the walk. It's God who carries you all the way. And so don't worry that you're not strong enough. If you have doubts about that, let me confirm it for you now. You're not strong enough. In case you've been wondering about it and you think, I don't know if I can become, let me confirm it for you. You can't. You can't do it, neither can I. You're not strong enough and neither am I. But God is. And if you have God, well, what else do you need? For man it's impossible, but for God all things are possible. And so trust him. Trust him. Whatever you have to do, whatever you have to do, you have to overcome an illness. You have to overcome a handicap. You have to overcome the problems of this world. You have to raise your children. You have to contribute to their sanctification. Whatever it is, and it seems impossible, trust. Trust in the Lord. He'll fight your battles for you. You will overcome all difficulties, and you will find that you'll come to the end of your journey, journey having succeeded in the mission which God entrusted to you. Filial trust. Trust God. If you can't trust God, you can't trust anybody. God is trustworthy. He can do all things, and he wills to do all things good for you. He's worthy of your trust. He's worthy of my trust. And so let's trust him. How come we complain of not being heard? The Catechism addresses that. Number 2735, in the first place, we ought to be concerned about whether or not our prayer is acceptable to him. Never mind about, well, did he answer my prayer? Wait a minute. Is your prayer acceptable to God? Be concerned about that more than you are about whether or not you get the prayer answered. You may pray, oh, Lord, please let me hit the lottery. <laughs> well... Is God necessarily pleased with a prayer like that? Not necessarily. No. You know? Uh, but if you pray, O oh Lord, increase in me faith, hope, and charity. Lord, grant me great love for the poor. 
Oh, Lord, help me to be a person of prayer. Help me to pray. I don't like prayer, dear Lord. It bores me. But help me to become a person of prayer. If you pray like that, I promise you, that's a prayer pleasing to God. And if you persevere in your prayer, God will answer that kind of a prayer without any question. Often we demand to see the results of our prayers. You know, I put a few coins in the slot machine, pull the handle. Okay, come on. You know, where, where's the jackpot? Put a few prayers in. All right, Lord, I prayed. You know, how come I didn't win the trip to Europe? Nothing happened. You know, that's not the attitude for a person of prayer. And so learn how to pray. What should you, if you could only pray for one thing, what should you pray for? The Holy Spirit. If you can only pray for one thing, pray for the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the gift which contains every gift. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, well, he's the spirit of love. You won't lack love. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he's the spirit of truth. You'll be filled with truth, and that's the essence of the faith. Hope, running out of hope. Well, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know very well that the promises are going to be fulfilled. And so pray for the Holy Spirit, or pray to do God's will. A lot of times people tell me, oh, Father, I really don't know what to pray for. Uh, that indicates it's a common question, not a bad question, but it indicates our lack of understanding of prayer. Why do we pray primarily? Well, we pray to give glory to God. We pray to adore him, to praise him, to worship him. We pray to thank him. And sometimes we pray the prayer of petition. We ask for things. That's okay to do. But most of all, we pray to give glory to God. God deserves a prayerful heart. And so pray to give glory to God. Pray to do his will. In his will is our peace. I could preach a long time on that one, but I don't have a long time. And so let me just leave it at that. If you love God's will, and he's, he is one with his will, God and his will are one, not separate. If you love God, you'll love his will. And if you pray the Our Father, know what you're praying. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Lord, may your will be done, whatever it is, even if it hurts, even if I don't understand it. May your will be done, because I know that your will, O oh Lord, is the most important thing, the most powerful thing. And so, are we convinced, though, are we convinced that we don't know how to pray? The Word of God tells us we don't know how to pray. Do you believe you don't know how to pray? Or do you think, oh, I know how to pray good, Father. I'm a, I'm a good prayer. I know all about it. And we can think that sometimes, and then, then God in his mercy lets us fall on our face, and we find out we're not so good at it as we thought. That's what the Catechism says in 2736. Are we convinced that we do not know how to pray as we are? As we are? The Holy Spirit knows, though. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. The Holy Spirit discerns the deep things of God. And so invoke the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you. And he will enlighten you, and you will begin to pray for the things that you should be praying for. How is our prayer efficacious? Well, faith rests on God's action in history. The Paschal Mystery, okay, the Paschal Mystery, Jesus won. Sometimes do you doubt whether you're going to win the battle of life. Sometimes I might doubt that myself about myself, but you know the answer. Jesus won. We are in him. The day we were baptized, we were taken up into Christ. That day, we became one with Jesus. Jesus is the head of his mystical body, the church. That's us. And so we are in Jesus mystically. And so that knowledge sets you free. Jesus said it. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We know that he suffered, we suffer. He died, we're going to die. 
but he rose again. And because we're in him, our suffering and our death is filled with power. And it's oriented toward resurrection. If you die with him, you're going to rise with him. And if you rise with him, you're going to reign with him for all eternity. Do not allow passing things to drag you down. I recently talked to a young person who was at times suicidal. And I said, why are you suicidal? Why don't you want to live? Well, because my, this girl that I like, this was a 15-year-old person, this girl that I like told me that she doesn't like me, and, but she's in love with my best friend, and so I don't want to live anymore. Very common. And so I tried to tell the person, but don't you understand what life is about? And then you try to explain the meaning of life and so forth. But people can become so caught up in the immediate little trials and tribulations of life that they become so crushed by it. They, don't, they can't go on. We have to carry the good news to them. And you know, if you know these things, if you really believe, then that truth in your heart sets you free and you have a certain joy. Um, Mother Teresa with the sisters, you know, one of the things that they have to do, they have to be joyful. And Mother is deadly with this one. If she finds a sister who isn't joyful, you know, they take care of the poorest of the poor. Dying people, the worst conditions imaginable. I had a, a great grace. Um, analogous, they take care of lepers you know, uh, in countries where there's a lot of leprosy, the sisters take care of the lepers. And now Mother has begun to take care of um, people with AIDS. And so they have a couple of hospices. And there's a small one in San Francisco. And one night, the sister superior said, Father, I, I want to ask you to do a favor for us. Uh, come over to the Gift of Love, which is the house for the AIDS patients. And she said, we have a man who we've been preparing, and he probably won't live much longer. And would you come and baptize him, confirm him, uh, give him First Eucharist and so forth? And, and so I went, and their community was gathered. And we had a beautiful uh, celebration. And this uh, brother, he took the, the name of uh, Augustine. And I thought it was a, a great name because he had, he had lived a rough life. He'd been in the street since he was 14. His mom was a good Catholic. Um, he was an African-American man, and his mother had always been Catholic, but she died from cancer when he was 14, and he couldn't understand why God would take his mother. And so it, it broke his heart, and it, he w ended up in the street. And he was about my age, and he lived more or less in the street all his life. And then he contracted AIDS, and he had been into drugs and everything, and, and the sisters found him and, and brought, them, brought him to the house, and he lives there with 11 other men. Uh, and they're all going to die soon, and the sisters give them love and help them to die with dignity. And so it was a great experience to be with them and to pray with them and, and to see the power that God answers our prayers the right prayers, know what to ask for. Well, what a beautiful thing. Uh, and my brother, Augustine, uh, he cried uh, through the whole thing. Uh, he might not understand all the theology of our faith, but the Lord touched his heart, and he knew that being baptized, that was a great gift, and he received Jesus in Holy Communion for the first time. And what a blessing. And he came... Every day after that, he came to the retreat. Uh, they would bring him, and he came, and he sat right there, and he listened attentively, and he's my brother. And it's a great gift when any one of us has a chance to enter into the joy of God's love. And so we should be joyful and some of the sisters said to me, but the novices said, Father, I, I have to be honest, I don't feel joy all the time. And I understand that I don't feel joy all the time either. 
And I assure you, the saints didn't feel joy all the time. But once again, you allow your mind and your will to overcome these things, and you decide to be joyful based upon what you know, based upon God's love for you. You decide, and that's love, you decide to be joyful, overcome your feelings. And so you transcend depression, and you transcend anxiety, and you say, but I've tried, Father, and I can't do it. And I have one piece of advice for you. <laughs> right. I said to the sisters, and I'll say it to you, well, we're coming close to the end, and you've got it. <laughs> Finally, you've got it. That's right. And so you pray. You pray to be joyful. You know, there, there are a lot of days when we don't feel good. But I'll tell you one sure way to overcome depression. Do something for somebody. Do something for somebody. Go out and help the poor. Feed a hungry person. Clothe a naked person. Help to house a homeless person. Do something. And you'll soon forget about your own troubles because you've warmed yourself with an act of charity. We need to persevere. We need to persevere in prayer, for to persevere in prayer is to persevere in love. It is possible to pray all the time. Now, we, we think, oh, Father, I can't pray all the time. Oh, yes, you can. You can. Because you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit's been given to you, the Holy Spirit can help you to pray always. But it doesn't come naturally. And it doesn't mean you have to pray on your knees formal prayer. We can't do that. But you can pray from the heart. You might say, but I, I can't think of it all the time. Then pray for the grace to think of it more. You can unite yourself. Just, just unite your heart with the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. You can say, Jesus, I trust in you. And that prayer of trust will increase your trust. You can say, Immaculate Heart of Mary, I place all my trust in you. And Our Lady will unite you with her Son, and she'll increase your trust. And pretty soon you're doing impossible things. I'm sure little Mother Teresa of Calcutta never imagined that one day in her own lifetime she'd have over 5,000 sisters living a life of great sanctity. I'm sure she never thought that she'd bring the gospel behind what was then the Iron Curtain. But she has now houses springing up all over Eastern Europe. They have a map at the convent in San Francisco, and that map, it's the map of the world, and it has pins in it. And every pin is where one of their houses, or it looks like a, a military map, you know, a strategy, you know. In, in the Army, we had a thing called the War Room, and it always had a map of the theater of operations. Well, Mother Teresa said the theater of operations is the world. You know, we have to go out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. And there were pins everywhere, even in the United States, all over the place. I'm sure that little sister, Mother Teresa never imagined in her wildest dreams when she walked out the door of her convent with nothing but trust in God that one day she'd have 5,000 plus sisters in over 500 religious houses all over the world ministering to the poorest of the poor, satiating the thirst of Jesus on the cross, which is the essence of their charism. And so prayer and the Christian life of faith, hope, and charity are inseparable, for they concern the same love and the same renunciation proceeding from love. And so we remember silence, be still. Be still and know that I am God. That silence will beget faith, and that faith will beget a life of prayer, and that prayer will beget love, and that love will beget service. And you'll be enabled to love God with your whole heart, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Please do these things. We remember the prayer of the hour of Jesus when his time had come to suffer and die. It's the high priestly prayer of Jesus. He intercedes for all of us. That's what a priest does. He's a mediator between God and men. And Jesus took all of us to the cross. He took all of our prayers, our aspirations, our desires, and our sins. And he nailed them to the cross. And he defeated sin. 
And he defeated Satan, and he defeated death on the cross. Dying, he destroyed our death. Rising, he restored our life. What a blessing. And we enter into the life and mission of the Lord Jesus. That's prayer. That's an intimate, personal relationship with the living God. And we come then to the prayer that Jesus taught us. You know, our Lord prayed all the time. Scripture tells us that he prayed before he did anything important. Oh, he prayed all night sometimes. He prayed up on the mountain. He prayed out in the garden. He prayed in the desert. He prayed before naming the apostles. He prayed at Gethsemane before being lifted up. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And his disciples would see him praying. And it moved one of them one time to say, Lord, teach us how to pray, as John the Baptist taught his disciples. When people see you pray, when people see that you are a person of prayer, you will influence them. I will tell you this. That past week that I spent giving a retreat, I give a lot of retreats and a lot of missions. But that eight days was such a blessing for me. Now, I did all the talking. (laughs) I assure you that I did all the talking. Those those poor sisters, they didn't say anything. You know, they, they wrote me some little questions, but, you know, they had to listen to me for eight days, and I was the retreat master, and I preached the retreat, and, you know, all the words were coming out of my mouth, and I hoped something good happened, but I want to tell you who got the retreat. I got the retreat, okay? Now, those sisters didn't preach to me by their words, all right? But I'll tell you what. We got the word Mother Teresa was dying, and they thought she was going to go a a week ago Thursday. It was really, she was right to the end. We got a fax from Calcutta. And so every house in the whole world, all 526 of them, they all were notified. Some of them maybe weren't because they don't have the right means of communication. And so the superior, Sister Mary Charbel, said, all right, all night we'll pray. Father, would you expose the blessed sacrament again for the third time that day? Of course, we did. On their knees, most all of them, some, you know, they don't have furniture in their chapels. They don't have kneelers. They don't have anything. And so they knelt without support, most of them, in front of the exposed blessed sacrament, some of them all night long. That is one of the most eloquent sermons I have ever, ever been privileged to experience in my life. And the whole week was like that. One thing to talk, another thing to do. And when you see that, it's so edifying. My life was enriched by being in their presence. I speak literally to tens of thousands of people. Through my cassettes, and we reach even more than that. Those sisters gave me a retreat by way of their presence and their witness. What happened to me? I was profoundly converted. I'm in need of conversion, just like everybody else. That will affect me and anyone I come in contact with for the rest of my life. That's a powerful witness, the power of prayer. And so when Jesus prayed and they saw him pray, that moved them to pray. You know, if you say, teach us how to pray, it means you want to pray. By seeing Jesus pray, they wanted to pray. Moms, dads, sisters, priests, everybody, pray and don't be afraid to be pious. Don't be afraid that the world will think that you're Oh, overly zealous. Don't be afraid to get down on your knees and pray before the Lord. And I tell you something, that witness is powerful. And you will bring the Lord. You will be a powerful preacher of the gospel by being faithful to that simple thing. Remember, by definition, God is pure simplicity. And so these simple things are godly things, and they're filled with power. And the Our Father, well, it's the sum and summary of our faith. Jesus taught them how to pray. In this beautiful prayer of the Our Father, it summarizes all the Old Covenant 
and all the Gospels, everything comes together in the prayer of the Our Father. All the scriptures, the laws, the prophets, everything, it's summarized in the Our Father. It's summarized also in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember that from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, 6, and 7. When Jesus gathered the disciples about him, he sat down and he began to teach them. That's where the Beatitudes are. That's how it starts with the Beatitudes in chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that the Lord's Prayer is the most perfect of prayers. In it we ask not only for all the things we can rightly desire, but also in the sequence that they should be desired. This prayer not only teaches us to ask for things, but also in what order to desire them. Okay? Now the Sermon on the Mount is teaching for life. The Our Father is a prayer for life. But in both, the one and the same spirit is moving in our lives. And so the Our Father is something that we should love very much. It's the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. When you pray, say, Our Father, etc. Now, the rightness of our life, that's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. The rightness of our life. All right, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, etc. Are you living the Beatitudes? You have to, because the rightness of our life, the holiness of our life, will depend on our prayer, and our prayer depends on the rightness of our life. They're interchanged. If you are right with God, if you're living an upright and moral life, if you're living the Beatitudes, if you are truly filled with faith, hope, and charity, then your prayer will flow from you in a spontaneous and beautiful way. It will be pleasing to God. Conversely, if you pray, you will be filled with that right spirit. And so it works both ways. And so if you want more faith, hope, charity, anything good, pray more. If you don't know how to pray or you're not praying well, exercise faith, hope, charity, the life of the church. Now, the power of the Holy Spirit permits us to pray with straightforward simplicity. Be a simple person. Don't be complicated and sophisticated. Be a simple, straightforward person. The Holy Spirit helps us to be simple and straightforward. Say yes when you mean yes. And know when you mean no. You know what Jesus said about all else. It's from the evil one. So be simple. Have trust. Feel your trust. Trust your heavenly Father. He is good. He is providential. He is merciful. He is loving. And if he's all those things, then we ought to trust him. Have confidence. Joyous confidence. Have joy because God loves you. Have joy because he has the power to answer your prayers. So be joyful. Humble boldness. Be bold with God. Listen, don't ask for picayune things. You know, if, if, let's face it. If, if you had entrance to the great king's court, you know, and, and, you, and, and you, he said to you, all right, you're all a good and loyal servant. I'm going to give you everything you want. And you say, oh, Lord, uh, could you give me 50 cents? That's what people do sometimes, you know. They ask for teeny tiny things. Ask for great things. Ask the Lord to make you a saint. Ask the Lord to sanctify your children, your husband, your wife. Ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord for big things. God wants magnanimous hearts. Don't be afraid to ask for great things. God wants us to ask for great things. And what's the greatest thing? God himself. Seek first the kingdom of God and all things else will be given unto you. And so, in humility, we come before the heavenly Father. We give him everything through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask the Father to bless us. The Father has blessed us. The blessing is Jesus. In him is all blessing. And the Father and the Son have sent forth the Holy Spirit, who is the blessing of God. 
My one piece of advice for you is accept the blessing. Accept 